Well, first of all, welcome everybody, and thanks for coming out in the rain and for this really uh, special event. And um, before we get started, um, just a couple of quick things. Um, the last event that I had for the season, at least so far anyway, they kind of just seem to sort of happen organically, but uh, Beth Stevens and Annie Sprinkle are going to be here on August 18th, which is Saturday. Um, to screen their new film, uh, Water Makes Us Wet, an ecosexual adventure, and they're pretty awesome. So if you can, and that's at 7.30, so if you can make it or if you're here, please do come. Um, and also feel free to hang out, check out the art, and all of that. Anyway, without further ado, um, I am so excited to have Sarah here. Um, and I'm going to read um, a little bit or a lot actually about her because she's done a lot and so bear with me. Okay, hey you guys. So um huh. so Sarah is a novelist, nonfiction writer, playwright, screenwriter, and AIDS historian. Her most recent works are The Cosmopolitans, which was chosen as one of the best books of 2016 by Publishers Weekly, and a non-fiction book, Conflict is Not Abuse, Overstating Harm, Community Responsibility, and the Duty of Repair. She recently published Israel, Palestine, and the Queer International, uh, which was published on Duke University Press, The Gentrification of the Mind, Witness to a Lost Imagination, um, on California Press, and uh, Ties of Mind, Familial Homophobia and Its Consequences. Um, also the paperback edition of her novel, The Near Future. Um, other nonfiction titles, aside from Ties of Mind, are Stage Struck, Theater AIDS and Marketing of Gay America, for which she won an Israel Fishman Nonfiction Award, and My American His History, Lesbian and Gay Life During the Reagan Bush Years. Previous novels include The Child, Shimmer, Empathy, Rat Bohemia, People in Trouble, After Dolores, which was awarded a Stonewall Book Award in 1989, Girls Visions and Everything, and the Sophie Horowitz story. Um, Sarah's also a playwright, uh, and some of her productions include Carson of Colors, um, uh, Manic Flight Reaction, and the theatrical adaptation of Isaac Singer's Enemies, a Love Story. As a screenwriter, um, her films include The Owls and Mommy is Coming, both co-written uh, with director Cheryl Dunya, and both screened at the Berlin Film Festival in 2010 and 2011. And Jason and Shirley, uh, directed by Stephen Winter, uh, which was also um, was supported by, the, by MoMA as well? Or yeah, it was I ran for a week at MoMA. I ran for a week at MoMA. And then um, I was so happy to, um, also, uh, Sarah and Jack Waters presented it here in 2015, which was really fantastic. Um, also, Sarah is a co-producer with Jim Hubbard on the feature documentary, United in Anger, A History of Act Up. Uh, as a journalist, uh, Sarah's essays have appeared in the New York Times, The Nation, and Interview. Um, she's won a Guggenheim Fellowship in Playwriting, a Fulbright in Judaic Studies, Two American Library Association Book Awards and is 29 uh, recipient of the Kessler Prize for Sustained Contribution in LGBT Key Studies. Um, Sarah is a professor at City University of New York, College of Staten Island, and a fellow of the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU, a member of the advisory board Jewish, of the Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, Sarah is a faculty advisor for Students for Justice in Palestine at the College of Staten Island. Her new book, Maggie Terry, A Novel of Murder and Intrigue, uh, will be published in September. And Sarah's current projects include a stage collaboration with Marianne Faithful, which I'm super excited about, <laughs> uh, The Snow Queen. And Sarah will tell you what else she's working on. Please give a warm round of applause. Jim Hubbard and I started the Act of World History Project. 
So for the next 17 years, I interviewed 187 surviving members of ACT UP New York. We put it up on a website called actuporalhistory.org. And one day, and if you go to the website, you can watch five minutes video of each person and you can download the transcripts for free. Can you hear me, by the way? It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Okay. So, um, I asked Jim, how many people have downloaded those transcripts? And he said, 550,000. I was like, well, how many visits have we had to the site? And he said, 11 million. So I was like, well, people want to know how ACTIV did it, because we're all so desperate right now. So, you know what, I think we should turn off the, the fan. Me too. Yeah, because I can't go any louder. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So, I, since I conducted all those interviews and I know what's in them, I thought, you know, I guess I have to write a book that coheres what active strategies were. Because active never theorized itself. So no one ever sat down and said, this is how we do it, and this is why. It just happened. So I decided that I would write this book, which is called Let the Record Show. So now I'm writing it. I've now finished 200 pages, and I'm realizing it's, the first draft is going to be 800 pages. And I can't believe I did this to myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to read you like the first 12 pages of a 50-page introduction. And then we can just talk about it. So it's about 20 minutes. And then whatever you want to know, I'll try to tell you. So the introduction is called How Change is Made. This is the story of a despised group of people with no rights, facing a terminal disease for which there were no treatments, abandoned by their families, government, and society, they joined together and forced our country to change against its will. Some men and women with AIDS fought until they died. The dead and the living ultimately transformed the crisis. This is an apocalyptic story of the first generation of AIDS activists who experienced the virus in a way that no subsequent generation would ever have to experience it again. For some, their days, months, years, and ACT UP were the most important times of their lives. For others, it was a chapter in a series of contributions. Some people went on to find a place in the world. Some lost their place forever. But because of commitment and brilliance, only these survivors carry the burden of the first years of the mass death experience that was AIDS. They made the world better for every subsequent HIV AIDS generation, in other words, the future facing the pain. Although the story of AIDS activism is one of heroism, it actually starts in suffering. AIDS without medication is a grotesque display of loss. Not only does every faculty disintegrate, the brain, the lungs, the nerves in one's legs, the ability to control shit, the tongue covered in thrush, the broken skin, even the normally unconsidered capacity to swallow and then to retain nutrition disappears. The body is no longer a mystery of synchronicity. It is a trap of literal pain and confusion, but also of social isolation. The diarrhea machine, the literal scarlet letter of cancerous Kaposi's sarcoma, eating away one's face, torso, legs, and arms, the rambling dementia, the shooting flames of neuropathy, even the fungal toenails don't usually make new friends. With the lack of treatment and services came the abandonment by family if they hadn't already thrown you out or driven you away. Life was surrounded by death. There was the systematic loss of your friends who were your support network and the witnesses to your life, which became the end of context and memory. There was the loss of jobs, end of career, no income, losing your apartment, the stairs on the street, the shunning by neighbors, acquaintances turning their backs or fading away, the silence of the government. Inevitably came a horrible death, possibly on a gurney in a hallway of an overwhelmed hospital, swimming in endless diarrhea and emaciated. But surprisingly, while many people joined ACT UP New York to end their own suffering, others came to confront someone else's pain. 
ACT UP was simultaneously a place of decline and a defiance of loss. Every Monday night, those few hundred people entered the ground floor meeting room at a crumbling old school that had become the gay center, then the lesbian and gay center, and now the renovated corporate LGBT center on West 13th Street. They came to save lives with humor, commitment, profound innovation, genius, will, and focus. But that meant that they also came to die and to watch disintegration. Because to make something better, we have to face it at its worst. And only a small group of people on this earth are willing to look pain in its real face, assess it accurately, listen, and then criticize themselves with rigor, find a productive way to cooperate, and rise to the occasion because the problem must be solved. People who are desperate are much more effective than people who have time to waste. Most of the men and women in New York City with AIDS never came to ACT UP, even at the height of its impact from 1987 to 92. Most of the people who loved someone with AIDS and wanted their lives to be saved, most of the people who felt empathy or identification with people with AIDS, most of them never came to an ACT UP meeting or action. There were many people who died in the closet rather than come to ACT UP. There were literally thousands, if not millions, of people who wanted AIDS to end, who, could met, who never could imagine themselves in a state of overt physical and public opposition to the police, the mayor, the president, the New York Times, science, art museums, and pharmaceutical companies. The thought of being handcuffed and arrested on television disrupted their image of their futures, which were never going to happen, but in fantasy depended on being appropriate. Being oppositional instead meant no business as usual, which for many was itself a loss of order and ambition. In order to change institutions, we have to confront institutions. And institutions, as well as the individuals who gain their power by being associated with them, become angry and punitive when they are questioned. In order to get out of hell, you have to be in hell. So pretending it's all fine and we'll all be fine won't get you out. Going to ACT UP meant every Monday night for the general meeting and for some, most every other night of the week and mornings before work for zaps or demonstrations. This decision toward action required constantly committing every literal day to face the disgusting, overwhelming, unbearable suffering of the fragile, devastated, deteriorating, enraged, sad, ingenious, committed, and very young people with whom we chose to be. The AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power was founded in New York City in 1987. It split in 1992 into ACT UP and the Treatment Action Group, TAG. 1996 saw the popular availability of protease inhibitors the compound medications taken daily that make it possible for people with HIV who have access to health care to live. In that short time, ACT UP designed a fast track system in which sick people could access unapproved experimental drugs. And then ACT UP, through direct action, forced the Food and Drug Administration to adopt it. ACT UP ran a four year campaign to change the Centers for Disease Control's definition of AIDS so that women could get access to benefits and be included in experimental drug trials. ACT UP made needle exchange legal in New York City and started Housing Works, a service for homeless people with HIV AIDS. ACT UP also helped force pharmaceutical companies and the government to change priorities in medical research to stop the same failed drugs from being studied over and over again. Their Countdown 18 Months campaign influenced a refocus of research onto opportunistic infections, thereby reconceptualizing the image of effective treatment. ACT UP ended insurance exclusion for people with AIDS and confronted the Catholic Church's attack on public school condom distribution. Images of ACT UP fighting back on the nightly news and through posters, community distributed video, and still photography created a new face for the world of people with AIDS and their allies as a vibrant, powerful grassroots force. This new queer PWA stood publicly with power and grace, and this defiant determination had long-range influence on how people with HIV and queer people saw themselves and were understood by others. 
At its height, ACT UP had about 500 people at a meeting. Our largest demonstration, Stop the Church, had only 7,000 people. A few committed activists, when focused on being effective, can accomplish a lot. However, while advocates were able, in a sense, to beat HIV, they could not beat capitalism. And so today, because of the greed of international pharmaceutical companies, large numbers of people with HIV in the world cannot receive the appropriate medications that already exist. For this reason, one million people still die every year of a disease that is entirely manageable. Some estimate that in the United States, only one third of infected people have access to the current standard of care because we do not have a coherent health insurance system. Linda Villarosa, a journalist with expertise in black people and AIDS, wrote in the New York Times in 2017 that black gay men in the US South today have higher rates of HIV infection than any country in the world. In New York City today, it is estimated that half of all AIDS deaths are diagnosed in the emergency room because the person had no health care. Racism distorted our understanding of AIDS from the beginning. Although the famous gay cancer study appeared in the New York Times in 1981, we now know that AIDS existed for decades before medicine finally recognized pattern symptoms in gay men. In 2008, I interviewed Betty Williams, a straight Quaker who came to ACT UP because of her long affiliation with homeless people and Haitians. She reported that in the 1960s and 70s, homeless people used the term junkie pneumonia to describe what we later came to understand to be pneumocystis pneumonia. And they also identified, quote, the dwindles a street term for what later was recognized as wasting syndrome. So homeless people knew about the AIDS crisis for decades at such a level of common parlance that support workers were aware of this initial street level AIDS vocabulary. But because poor people cannot get adequate health care, this epidemic, so well known as to inspire language, remained invisible to science. The first name affixed to this illness, which would eventually be called Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, AIDS, was GRID, <coughs> Gay-Related Immune Deficiency. The idea of a gay disease reflected the idea that homosexuality was itself a disease. The term GRID also reflects the lack of recognition that homeless people could be gay or be men having sex with men, just as in later years, gay men with AIDS were assumed to have not shared needles. Breaking down the disease into behaviors instead of identities took many years and required the participation of people with AIDS from the spectrum of humanity. By July 3, 1981, when the New York Times reported cases of rare cancer seen in 41 homosexuals, there were already 200,000 people infected in the United States. Direct action. <coughs> In his landmark article of American Radicalism, Letter from Birmingham Jail, sorry, 1963, <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King laid out the tactical structure of civil rights protest. Quote, in any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices exist, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action, end quote. Even though it was never expressly stated, repeated examination of ACTUP's approach revealed that we used a version of this approach without knowing about it. One, identify your issues based on the lived experiences of people with AIDS. Two, education, become the expert on your subject. Three, design the solution. Instead of acting in an infantilized relationship to those in power, begging them to solve problems, ACT UP used their required, acquired and innate expertise to design reasonable, doable, and winnable solutions. Four, present the solution to the powers that be. And when they refuse to listen, five, ACT UP's process of what Dr. King called self-purification was a combination of nonviolent civil disobedience training, emotional political bonding through the creation of affinity groups, and the putting in place of highly organized support systems of marshals and volunteer lawyers to ensure that no one would get lost in the system. Teachings created a highly informed rank and file, all of whom were encouraged to be spokespeople, and sophisticated media workers combined grassroots video activism and high-level media contacts to present ACT UP's demands. 
Five, then ACTUP would do nonviolent direct action to, quote, speak through the media, not to the media. Six, thereby creating public pressure on the powers that be to move towards ACTUP's reasonable solution. It was the black civil rights movement interpretation of direct action that best represents ACT UPS. Probably the best historical example would be the events of February 1, 1960, when black students from A&P College sat in at the segregated lunch counter of a Woolworths in downtown Greensboro, North Carolina. While they did have a supporting picket outside on the street, they did not only have a picket. Instead of asking through chants and posters for the segregated lunch counter to lose its whites-only restriction, they did direct action. They literally sat at the counter, thereby actually integrating the counter. For one moment, <coughs> before being beaten and enduring food spilled onto their heads and clothes, before arrest, these young people created an image that has survived the decades and become emblematic of protest. They created the world that they wanted to see. In this tradition, most of ACT UP's public protests were creative actions. Instead of marching around with signs and listening passively to speakers as the sole end all of an organizing experience, ACT UP created elaborate images of the obstacles they were fighting and the world they wanted to live in. So for example, in the famous Stop the Church action in December 1989, ACT UP did not only protest the Catholic Church's interference with condom distribution in public schools with signs, <clears throat> While 7,000 protesters did do a conventional demonstration outside, a small group of activists literally went inside the church and nonviolently disrupted mass. This direct action showed that because the church's actions jeopardized people's lives, ACT UP would not abide by traditional standards of secular movements targeted by the church staying out of religious rights. If we truly knew that our lives mattered, then we showed this by literally stepping into the church's space, just as they were doing by interfering in the public sphere of city schools. The form of direct action was part of its message. This created more opportunity for our ideas to reach the public. It also kept ACT UP's creative and imaginative membership ever interested and engaged and fulfilling the artistic vision conjured in the minds and hearts of its members to accompany and highlight each issue and event on the organization's political agenda. In this way, campaigns were structured as a series of interconnected actions designed to produce a larger outcome. ACT UP would never just do a demonstration zap or action to stand on its own. These public expressions were designed to build to the next step, that's why every event had a sign-up sheet or leaflets announcing further actions. Every action included a component of giving participants and observers something else to do. In this way, energy was not wasted and events had purpose as part of a larger schema. <clears throat> How a predominantly white male organization won the movement's greatest victory for women, people of color, and poor people. It is very unusual for movements or groups that are dominated by men and white people to achieve transformational victories that improve the lives of women, people of color, and poor people. And certainly the fact that ACT UP did this stands in great contrast to the history of gay male politics, which has led to race and class-based reconciliation with the state. Interestingly, despite profound racism and sexism, ACT UP won a four-year multifaceted campaign to change the Center for Disease Control's official definition of what symptoms constituted AIDS. At the time, the US government defined AIDS by symptoms that infected women did not often have, like Kaposi's sarcoma, while simultaneously excluding female-specific symptoms like uncontrollable yeast infections or severe pelvic inflammatory disease. As a result, women with HIV who were overwhelmingly poor could not qualify for benefits and could not participate in experimental drug trials, and as a result, treatments were not developed on a female model. As ACT UP used to say, women don't get AIDS, they just die from it. Most importantly, once issues relevant to women and or people of color with AIDS were articulated, female and POC ACT UP members did not waste their time trying to teach their white male comrades to be less sexist and racist. 
Discussions on the floor of the Monday night meeting did raise issues of gender and race, sexism and racism in the way actions were being approached. But women and people of color did not stop the drive towards action to correct or control language or to call out bias. Instead, people of color and women in ACT UP stewarded ACT UP's considerable resources, literal money, group energy and passion, and more elusive connections <coughs> projects that primarily aided women, poor people, and people of color. The founding of ACT UP Puerto Rico, for example, was a case in which part of the $1 million ACT UP raised in an art auction was used to finance a handful of Latino and Latina members to go to Puerto Rico to jumpstart AIDS activist organizing there. In other words, the language and behavior of racist and sexist ACT UPers was not the focus. It was their energy, money, and connections diverted to larger communities and broader goals. Simultaneity, simultaneity of action, not, not consensus. Although it wasn't made explicit at the time, ACTUP's process of dealing with such dramatic difference in diversity of experience and approach among its members was to practice a kind of radical democracy. During its height of influence, ACTUP never demanded full agreement for an action or campaign to be taken up. For example, if I wanted to participate in an illegal needle exchange on the Lower East Side in order to get arrested and wage a test case trial, and you didn't want to, you would not stop me from doing it, you just wouldn't do it. If instead you wanted to organize a demonstration against the Catholic Church and I didn't want to, I simply wouldn't do it. In this way, many different expressions of direct action were carried on simultaneously, none of them requiring full consensus or agreement. This method allowed each act up to respond in a way that made sense to them and reflected where they were at as long as it was direct action with a goal related to ending the AIDS crisis and not social services. The differentiation between direct action and social services were rooted in the understanding that activists created change that required policy and social service providers and later AIDS professionals institutionalized and carried out policy. All of this was handled through a loose structure. General Monday night meetings were run by a relaxed version of Robert's Rules of Order. People were asked to voluntarily restrain from voting unless they had been to three meetings, but no records were kept and no one was challenged. The Monday night agendas were set by the two elected facilitators who would include and prioritize reports or motions for action from the main committees. Committees changed over the years, but examples would be the Actions Committee that coordinated large organization-wide actions, fundraising, treatment and data, majority action, which was one of the six or seven groups of act uppers of color, media, and many others. Each committee sent a representative to the weekly meetings of the coordinating committee where responsibilities were assigned, money dispersed, and efforts synchronized. At the same time, people self-divided into small affinity groups that were not accountable to the larger body and did not have to clear their activities with the floor. So for example, when the Monday night meeting decided to do an action at the Food and Drug Administration, it was organized through the coordinating committee. But at the demonstration, individual affinity groups appeared with their own artistic and creative expression. When it came to doing nonviolent civil disobedience, often affinity groups would participate together and often got arrested together. When people got sick and died, often affinity groups would transition into being care teams. Affinity groups involved 10 to 20 people who met on their own time in their own apartments and would keep their presentation a secret so that the presumed police infiltrators would not be tipped off. Although every meeting started with the announcement, quote, if there are any uniformed or plainclothes members of the New York Police Department or any law enforcement agency, including the FBI here, you are required by law to identify yourselves now. Even though no one ever did identify themselves, ACT UP always assumed that because they were having an impact, they were being watched. And actually, we did get the files through the Freedom of Information Act, and they were entirely redacted. <laughs> this freedom of expression within the movement was not born of theory, but of necessity. Many people in ACT UP did not have long to live. They were working against the clock to try to save their own lives. This lack of time made people more efficient and more flexible, and it turns out that flexibility was exercised in a way that created more efficiency. For example, if it came up at a Monday night meeting that a letter needed to be written to a commissioner, 
someone would volunteer to write it. Often that person would simply be trusted to write the letter and send it. There was often no process by where a large committee would vet the letter, changing words here and there, arguing over punctuation or vocabulary. We just didn't have time for that level of control. In this way, people were allowed and encouraged to take responsibility for their task and to complete it without being micromanaged. Because the stakes were so high, overall this was a successful approach. It kept the organization moving actively forward and allowed each individual a kind of freedom of expression to respond to AIDS in the way that made sense to them. And ultimately, this very wide range of simultaneous responses in multiple social milieu with different concrete aims and involving different targets and participants strengthened ACT UP because it created a large resonant cumulative impact that singular activity never could have produced. After all, people can only be where they are at and movements that try to force everyone into being in the same place, having the same analysis, using the same strategies, or using the same words, never ever works. <laughs> movements that allow and help people respond to crises in the ways that make sense to them ultimately become the most effective movements. Today, when so many different kinds of people are under attack from the current regime, it would be stupid to demand conformity of approach. In a moment of crisis, micro-critique is sabotage. The big tent structure in which different constituencies are supported to respond the way they feel is best, I think, is our only hope. Thank you. So that introduction is 12 of 50 pages. And those 50 pages, I go through all of ACT UP strategies and tactics, how they work, and try to articulate them so that people reading it can use them. So that the index is a takeaway, standalone, sort of handbook thing. Chapter one is on Puerto Ricans and ACT UP. One of the things that has made me incredibly angry is the whitening of the history of AIDS activism. If you look at horrible movies like How to Survive a Play, which I wish was never made, you would think that ACT UP was all white men. And I actually saw um, a debate between Jim Hubbard, who directed United in Anger, which I co-produced with him, and David Franz, who made How to Survive a Play. And somebody from the audience asked him, why did you have no women or people of color in your movie? And he said, I focused on rich white men because they had enough time to be activists. That made me so angry, because if you even look at the Act of World History Project, over and over again, people tell you that they gave their entire lives to Act of, regardless of where they were on the social, in the social structure. So that's why I wanted to start Chapter 1 on Puerto Ricans in Act of. I just thought there were three Latino committees in Act of, and I just wanted like that to start the thing. The second chapter right now is on the very first treatment activists, who are not the people who are famous now. The people who are in How to Survive the Plague, they were the second group. The first group, and I, I, I could talk forever, so I'll just be brief, but <coughs> it was started by a string.